So what is the total time derivative in fluid mechanics? And why do we care so much about it? What's it, what's it good for? Well, what we want to do is to calculate, to express uh, fluid flow in a way that is called Eulerian. And this is by opposition to Lagrangian point of view. Uh, so let me show you what it's, what it's about. We have a problem. We have a problem when we study fluid flow. And this problem is that it's difficult to track all the particles. When we ask ourselves where a fluid flow particle is going, uh, we may answer it in the way that we do with solid mechanics. So if you look at the movement of a satellite, for example, what you would do is you would calculate the sum of forces that apply on the satellite. Uh, and based on this, you would say the sum of forces is equal to mass times acceleration. And acceleration is a change in time of velocity. So you could track the velocity of the satellite as it's moving around the Earth. That's a very good method if you have one object, like one car or one satellite. Uh, so Newton, Newton's second law, um, is very useful for one particle. And what you obtain in the end is a, is a trail of velocity vectors. Uh, so you have the velocity of the particle as a function of the initial conditions, where it was at the start. And then this changes as a function of time. This is cool. Uh, but for a fluid, it's a, it's a little bit more complicated. So let's say you are looking at a river flow. This is a, a river in the beautiful southern Alps of France. You have this river coming in, and let's say you're studying the flow at the bottom of this picture right here, and you're interested in calculating the fluid flow over here. The question is, which particles do you pick to study the velocity of the water over there? Well, you would take particles that are coming up from upstream. And so you follow those particles as they come along, and you would then get a few particles here and their corresponding velocity, because you track them as they're coming, they're coming down the water. But the problem with this is that uh, the river flow is unsteady. It's changing with time. And so if you take the same picture at a different point in time, then you have a different uh, fluid flow. And since the flow is different, then uh, the particles that are here now are not the same as before. The, uh, if you track the particles, they're moving from some other place. And so you have to figure out when you're studying the flow down here, where are the particles were that are here now? Um, and this is very messy because it, the answer to this question will change with time, continuum, as particles cross one another and move um, uh, and the flow changes in an unsteady manner. Uh, take another example. You take the, the flow behind a car mirror. You can pretend this is your car and you're driving along Sachsen-Anhalt on the way to university and uh, air behind the mirror makes some kind of noise and you want to study the fluid flow behind the car mirror. Um, and you're interested in the, in, the, in the velocity right here behind the mirror. Uh, to do this, if you track the particles as they move along, uh, you have to figure out which particles uh, ahead of the car you have to look at uh, so that by the time they arrive behind the mirror, um, they have the velocity that you're interested in. So it's very difficult to figure out who the particles are here and where they were before. So you can match their trajectory and finally reconstruct what is happening behind the mirror. Uh, so the, if you summarize, there are three problems, three problems with fluids. In, in using the Lagrangian method, the tracking method. One is that to study a local problem, a problem right behind the mirror of the car, you need to find where the particles were uh, before, so their initial point, um, and, and where those particles were that are here now. <laughs> and so you need a really, really good accounting methodology to figure out where things are going um, and how this changes with time. Second problem is that molecules uh, travel from one fluid particle to the other. So if you imagine now if you have this, this river uh, flow here and you take one particle here and you, you drop some ink into there so that it's, it looks like a, a blue view, blue cube, um, just a few seconds or even split seconds uh, later, uh, this ink will have spread all over uh, because particles strain and deform um, as they flow down. So it becomes very messy to compute or to track uh, the position of uh, one particle as it flows along. As after a while, you have to ask yourself, um, is this really a particle? Is this, is this still a particle? Is this still a cube that I'm looking at? And, and the third problem is that 
to compute what is happening to this particle, to compute how its velocity vectors, um, its velocity vector will be shifted left or right or forwards or backwards. You have to compute what the other particles next to it are doing. It, it, they all depend one on another. Um, so to compute what's happening now, you need to know what the neighbors are doing. And so uh, you need to figure out what its neighbors are now, not the neighbors that it had before when you started the computation. Um, so you have to solve simultaneously all the trajectories um, as a function of time. And those trajectories change as a function of time. So um, it becomes a very difficult accounting problem. Um, the best way to do this would be to have a structured manner, structured local grid in space, and to let the flow pass through this grid. And you would solve the problem locally in space. So you would calculate what the velocity is at this moment of the particle that is passing through and not follow the particle along. Um, so this is called the Eulerian description after the Swiss mathematician Euler, who came and said that Lagrange was uh, pretty nice and it was a useful way of describing movement, but only for solids and for fluids we needed something else. What we want, says Euler, is the velocity of uh, the fluid flow, the velocity of the water or of the air, but measured as described at a point. And at this point, we have three components, and we, we describe this as a function of time and of the coordinates of the point. So we're not following the particle at all. And so what we want to do in the end is to have a velocity field um, that's the point that is changing with time, but it's not moving. We're, we're letting the flow pass through uh, the velocity vectors, and we're measuring how those velocity vectors change with time. So a way to say this is that uh, local beer, local beer tastes better. And this is a uh, what definitely something you should learn if you live in Germany is that the worst offense you could do if you get a, a beer uh, with uh, colleagues in the evening is to order one of those awful beers uh, for which you see advertising on TV. On the contrary, you should ask uh, what uh, the best local beers are to be tasted. And this is because, uh, I say this because you need to compute things locally and not follow things as they go along. Um, so Euler, Euler beats Lagrange and, and brings up, comes up with the total time derivative. So let's, let's take a look at this. Problem, as you have now understood, I think, is to quantify the measure obtained at the fixed probe as a function of the properties of the thing that's flowing through. Okay, so what we want to do is, is to look at a case like this. Uh, this is a, um, a canal, this is a water canal, this is the Canal de Provence in southern France. And it's just the water passing through uh, and imagine you're sitting there and it's a very nice summer day and the cicadas are singing and you lay a plank across the canal like so and uh, you sit in the middle and you remove your shoes and you let your feet dip into the water when you do this you're going to measure with your feet the local temperature of the water this is a very pleasant experience because it's nothing fresh and now i want you to imagine that the temperature of the canal is constant doesn't change with time but upstream, coming up towards your feet, is water that has higher temperature. So that the temperature of the canal is not uniform. And your feet is, uh, are dipping in here. And the water coming up to those feet has higher temperature. What is going to happen is you're going to measure a change in time of temperature. This is because your feet are not moving. So if we express the problem perhaps in a more mathematical way, imagine that you have water here. And you, you put your probe, uh, which could be your, just your feet, your, your toes, um, and you measure the temperature here. And the temperature you measure there is the temperature of the water. There's no doubt about this. But this temperature here um, is not uniform. It's changing as a function of space. And the water that's coming up here has higher temperature than the water that you have here. As the water flows, it's going to arrive at your feet, and you're going to measure an increase in temperature. What is this increase? How do we express it? Well, the rate of change of temperature in, in my toes is this, is a change in time of the temperature at the probe. This is equal to the speed at which the water is coming. The faster the water is coming and the faster the temperature will increase, multiplied by the rate of change of the temperature with respect to space. So the space derivative of water. 
Uh, now, if you add up on top of this a global rate of change, so for example, you say the canal is cooling down or the canal is heating up at a, at a, at a fixed rate, um, then you're going to have to add this rate on top of what you measure. And so we have the same equation as before. This is what we measure at our feet. Um, and this is the part that brings us hotter water. But to this, we add this rate of change of the, temp of the temperature at the particle. Uh, so this is the rate at which the canal is cooling down or heating up. And what we want to do is to express this as a function of the rest. So we swap this equation around, and this is, this is what we want to quantify. What's happening at the particle we express it as a function of what we measure at the probe plus a term here that we're going to call the convective or advective term. Okay, so we generalize this with three dimensions and we get this. If we have a property A, the rate of change in time of A measure at a fixed point in space is called the total time derivative of A. And we write it with a capital D, uh, dA over dt like this. We write it like this, d over dt, the total rate of change, is the local rate of change, uh, plus the x component of velocity multiplied by the change in x, plus the y component of velocity multiplied by the rate of change in y, plus the z component of velocity multiplied by the rate of change in z. So if you apply it, for example, to a, to a scalar field A, could be temperature, could be pressure, uh, then you're going to have this expression like this. And immediately, quickly, in an engineering classroom, um, you end up with people who just raise their hand and say, this is nice, but it's very tedious to write. There's got to be a better way of writing this. And there is. Um, so let's take a look. We use two nice tools uh, that we have from before. Uh, one is the NABLA operator, uh, which is here, which we used before in a gradient operator. And then we have the velocity field, which is here. And we say then the advective operator is the dot product of V and the NABLA operator. And this, it doesn't mean anything. It's, it's an operator. It's waiting to be applied to something. And this then comes up as u times partial over partial x plus v times partial over partial y plus w over partial w multiplied by partial over partial z. This operator, then we, we fit it in a total time derivative. So we can write the total time derivative with two components. One is uh, the local change in time. And the other one is the advective or convective part. Like so. so if you apply this to a temperature field, uh, you get this function here. This is uh, very cool. So let me let me show you let me show you what it's good for. Um, let's imagine you have a, a body a body of water maybe, um, and this is this body which is represented with these colors here, and um, this body is cooling. The whole piece of water is cooling at one degree per second, everywhere. So if you stick your probe into this, you're going to measure minus one degree per second. But then you add up to this. The fact that this whole body of water doesn't have uniform temperature. It's hot on this side and it's cold on that side there. Um, and it's moving at a certain velocity. So that as time passes, this whole block of water will be shifting. And you will be measuring the temperature of particles which are ever hotter. So the question is, at which rate does the temperature change at the probe? You measure here the temperature and you start in the middle of 15 and five. So you start at 10 degrees and the water is cooling at one degree per second. What is the rate of change of temperature that you measure at the probe here? Now, you can be very brave and uh, very strong and you can pause the video right now and solve it for yourself and see the answer. But if you're not that brave, I will solve it for you. So let's take a look we express the total change in time of temperature. And it's written like this. Uh, total change in time is the local change in time plus the convective part of temperature. Um, and what we want to do is now split this or, or express this as all the components that are inside, that are hidden inside. But since we have only one dimension, we we'll only have the x direction, um, we have now only one component, which is u. u multiplied by partial t partial x. So what do we want in here? We want to measure here the rate, the local change of temperature with respect to time as a function of the other two terms. So we swap this equation around. And the partial t, partial t, like this, is a total time derivative of t minus the velocity multiplied by the rate of change in space. So what do we do with this? 
and put in numbers. This is by how much the water is cooling everywhere. And then do this, I subtract the minus here, the velocity of the water, three meters per second, and then the change in time, or sorry, the change in space of that temperature. So I take the difference, uh, we take a, a local finite difference, basically, the difference in temperature uh, divided by the difference in distance, like this. And this is interesting because you see now that the whole water is cooling at minus one degree per second. So the rate of change of temperature locally is, or of the particle locally, is one degree per second. But the rate of change you're going to measure is different because to this we add a positive number, which is 3 times 0 0.5, which is 1.5 degree per second. So even though the particle is cooling down, it's losing temperature, we are measuring an increase in temperature. And this is because the temperature of the particles that we measure um, is changing with time because hotter particles are coming all the time towards us. So that in the end, uh, we are measuring an increase in time of temperature at the probe over there. So this is what this, this tool is good for. It allows you to measure things from a different point of view or changes in time of things from a different point of view, from a steady point of view. The trick summary um, is this, the cool kids, the cool kids who do computational fluid dynamics, they never flow the fluid. They never follow the particles along as they're moving and they never track the, the, the position of those particles. Instead, they just oscillate vectors. They just look at the field of vectors that are not moving, um, not changing position. They all have fixed position and those vectors are changing in length and direction. And this is what the cool kids calculate. This is what we do with computational fluid dynamic simulation. So in the end, what we're doing is basically what you see when you stand by a wheat field that's oscillating with the wind. We're looking at vectors that change direction and uh, length, but that are not moving. And so we're tracking the movement of the fluid in this way. And this way. So you see now um, we have reached into the fortress. Um, Lagrange, who told us that you have to follow the particles as they move along, uh, is dead. And, and uh, the guy who killed it is, um, is Euler. Euler tells us you have to use a total time derivative. And with a total time derivative, you can organize your calculations in a much more structured way. You can just draw a grid and locally every time measure the change in time of the vector. And this enables, um, it enables a lot of good things. And the first thing that's going to come up is that Cauchy is going to take the Eulerian point of view and is going to write out uh, Newton's second law in a Eulerian structured manner. And this is going to be really cool, but not completely immediately useful. And so um, two people are going to take Cauchy, uh, Cauchy's equation and are going to transform it into something that's immediately useful. And those two people are Navier and Stokes. But this is a story for the next video.